Well, a lot has happened since we last talked. Fromber, we don't know his status as of right now, but it seems to be a trend what we see in Major League Baseball with pitchers. The Astros did split with the Rangers in the first series of the Silver Boot Series. We're going to talk about the Astros news around the league on this edition of Back to the Bullpen. I'm looking to the bullpen to bring my lefty in. Keep the lead and make your team look pedestrian. It's in your wood house, we'll swing for the fence. You know it's money around here, man, I ain't talking expense. Strike one, heat a low in the way, you can't hit it. You know you want to start a rally, but you better forget it. Strike two, off speed, same spot, you're caught looking. Get ready at the plate, this time you're not cooking. Strike three, swing it out of the zone. You ain't even touch it first. Tell me how they gonna drive you home. Walk your back, walk your back, looking like we ain't cool then. The game's over, might as well put them back to the bullpen, oh yeah. That's right, and the Houston Astros did go back to the bullpen, and the bullpen looked good in Arlington. Look, I'm H.M. Wheelhouse. You can find me at H.M. Wheelhouse on X, Instagram, and TikTok. You can find the show at B2 Bullpen on X on Instagram and find us on Spotify. And you can also find us now on YouTube as Back to the Bullpen Podcast. I've got my co-host, the illustrious, the World Series champion, the former Major League pitcher, Mike Stanton in the house. Mike, tell everybody where they can find you. Mike Stanton, 29 on X, formerly known as Twitter. What a game tonight. Goodness gracious. We thought it was going to be a slugfest, and it turned out that way a little bit. But uh, after that first inning, really didn't know what to expect. Yeah, that was, you know, a lot of tough things, a lot of interesting things in the timeline of today where we first heard the news that Fromber was scratched and there was no word on the lineup and there was no word on. And so I had, I had probably 15 different DMS. Hey, what do you know? Are the Astros <laughs> trading Fromber? What's going on? Is there an injury? Maybe he's on bereavement leave. I mean, there were all these speculations. Right. And then of course um, you have your rookie pitcher who gets a call and they say, um, Mr. Henley, uh, we're going to, we're going to need your services today. Yeah. I need you to get up here to Arlington. So it was a kind of a wild day because you and I actually spoke during the day and neither one of us knew we were waiting for the presser to happen. Right. Um, there in Arlington. So Fromber, let's just not bury the lead. Fromber getting scratched. Um, they say he's not on the IL, but you know, Mike. Well, it's elbow soreness is the official term that they are using. Um, they are also being cautiously optimistic about the situation. But, you know, we've got a pandemic going on in Major League Baseball, and it is arm injuries with young pitchers. The thing is, this isn't anything new. This is something that's been going on for easy a decade, maybe even more than that. But uh, this was a tough week for pitchers. You know, we'll have to keep our fingers crossed about Fromber that maybe it is just some residual soreness. He threw the ball very well his last time out, um, you know, went deep, deep in the game. So maybe it's just, you know, early, early, early spring arm soreness and uh, he can get right back in there. But I mean, we've had some some uh, young aces, young number one pitchers going down. We've got. Uh, Spencer Strider with Atlanta, with Tommy John, Shane Bieber with Cleveland, Tommy John, Garrett Cole has been out since spring training. Uh, Yuri Perez, Jonathan Lewisica, another Yankee uh, pitcher that's gone down yeah. with an arm injury. So, yeah, there's a, a real issue going on, and we've got you know the Players Association, and we've got Major League Baseball pointing fingers at this situation, at that situation. It's not one thing. There's there's no way this is there's one thing. Every in every situation, every pitcher is a little bit different. It's a combination of a whole bunch of things. Uh, but yeah. And and then and the you know, Brett, the unfortunate thing is, I don't think there's a fix. I don't think there's something you can do. Uh, you know, because I think of personally, I think one of the big issues, a lot of the injuries are at least starting. When the when these pitchers are still amateurs, you know, yeah, there may be there there's there's arm injuries going on. You know, we talk about Tommy John and how it's how it's surging right now in Major League Baseball. It's surging in college. It's surging in high school. 
there's 12 year olds out there getting Tommy John surgery. I mean, there's a, Unreal. it's a much bigger issue than, than, you know, just, a just some pitchers at the big league level going down with surgeries. Exactly. And I was in the, I was in the, um, you know, press conference with Justin Verlander after he made his first um, rehab start. We'll kind of hit on that a little bit, but he talked about how his Instagram feed is filled with kids that are 10, 11, 12 years old that are going to these, going to these programs to try to increase their velocity. And he's like, yep. I see advertisements. We can improve your son's speed by 15 miles per hour. And the thing is, you've got these arms, and you know better than I do. I didn't have as long a pitching career as you did. Mm -hmm. um, but I remember, you know, we weren't – we were taught to throw strikes, not necessarily to throw hard, but I was right. always told you want to be careful what you throw and how you throw it because your arm you're, – you're still developing. You're still growing. Like, you haven't matured into your body yet. So if you try to do too much with the arm, you're going to throw your arm off. You're going to rag sure. your yeah. Yeah. We were taught to pitch. You know, it yeah. wasn't about velocity, but one of the things JV said, and I thought JV, it was, he made some great points in that interview, um, was that every pitch that everybody throws right now is max effort, everything you got, you know, snot flying, just throw the ball as hard as you can, spin the ball as hard as you can. When in reality, that's not pitching, that's throwing. And yeah. I think that, you know, one of the issues that you see uh, in, in, in a lot of pitchers, even in Major League Baseball, is the lack of command, that they don't know where the ball's going. You know, I've, I've, I've said it so many different times. Pitching is just like real estate. It's location, location, location. You know, I can have a slow spinning curveball that's not very hard, but if I can put it in the right spot, it's still going to be effective. And so uh, the, the other part of it is, the, you know, one of the things that, that, that Justin said was, you know, just the mentality of how they pitch now. Everybody's spinning the ball more. You know, a couple of years ago, I think two years ago, um, was the first time in Major League Baseball history that there had been more off-speed pitches thrown than fastballs. Wow. And, and you know, breaking balls are a little bit, especially when you're really working on you know, the spin rate and trying to get the spin rate high and you're cranking on it a little bit harder. It's a little bit harder on your elbow, you know? So it's, it's there, but it's, that's not it. There's a combination. There's an endless list of things that we could go through. That is the culprit here. And that's why I say, I don't think there's a real fix. No. Right. And I, I do think you could start with number one, I think two big thing. One thing that Justin said, he's been talking about since 2016 is how the ball is manufactured, the shape of the balls ball. Have changed. How, balls have how, changed. How slick it is. I remember the first time, Mike, that I, um, we were at a, I believe it was an LSU baseball game, and one of the Southern baseball players threw my son up a ball, and those those baseballs, the the stitches are raised mm -hmm. so high, yeah, and like so much easier to grip. And then when you compare that to a major league baseball, it's almost like it's made out of ceramic or right. linoleum. And then I go to the Tyler glass now interview after he talks about, he's getting yeah. Tommy John and he talked about how he went from holding the baseball in his hand out to having to push it to the back of his hand. Yeah. It's called choking. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Basically had to choke the baseball. And he said, you would be surprised how much more you're using your body. He said the first, oh, sure. I went cold Turkey. He said, cause I use sunscreen and rosin. The first time he went cold turkey without anything helping him. I just use pine tar and rosin, by the way. There you go. There you go. <laughs> and he said the day after, he said, I had soreness in muscles that I didn't know I had in my right. body because I was putting strain. And I think that's been a problem. Oh, you're I, using muscles differently than you true, usually do. True. And when you hold the ball deeper in your hand, uh, and what Ty, what, what Glass now is talking about is he's over gripping the ball. He's, he's, you know, you remember old, you know, old time ball players used to say, Hey, you hold the baseball like an egg. So you hold it nice and soft. Well, that's right. not, that's not, because I'm trying to spin the ball. 
I'm not holding it nice and soft. I'm gripping it hard. And that's just putting more stress on the elbow, especially when you talk about the velocity. You know, you have a you have a pitcher that throws the ball 95 miles an hour. His arm is coming through more like, you know, 98 to 100 miles an hour. Uh, even if it's for a right. short period, a very short uh, span of time, that's just that much more stress on the elbow. Listen, God did not create us to throw overhand. That's why we break. You know, you want to see some crazy numbers? Go look at the top uh, softball pitchers in the country. Yeah. the col- I mean, the, the, go look at the end of the season. So in June, go look at the, you know, pick a, pick a school that's got a top pitcher. Right. Crazy. They're throwing 300-plus innings. They're striking out five, 600 batters in a season because that's a natural movement right. of the arm. Throwing overhand like we do in baseball, it's not a natural movement. Oh, and, and I remember back in back in the early 2000s, whenever Roger Clemens came over to the Astros, him and Pettit were with them for the one World Series run that they had. But I remember getting a picture. My dad had this really nice camera, so he let me take it to the game. And I can't seem to find this picture. And I, I'm still looking for it. <laughs> but I've got a great picture picture of him full stride, and it's it's his elbow, and it looks like his elbow was just being ripped or shredded yeah. because he's putting so much force and so much torque. And this was, this was late career, Roger Clemens. This yeah. wasn't 20 strikeout in Boston, Roger Clemens, yeah. you know, this is a little bit older, a lot more aware, but man, was he humming it. And, and that right there, that's what Justin focused on. He said, I don't know how we turn back the clock, but if we don't do something I just think it's going to continue to get worse. Right. It and, is. And and I absolutely hate this. Hate because, uh, listen, the, the worst invention there's been in baseball is the radar gun. Mm. You know, because, how, you know, how many – I tell pitchers all the time, and I work with amateur pitchers uh, just about on a daily basis, and I tell them, and this is, you know, I'm, I'm – I you know, Call me an old dude or whatever, but you know, I tell them velocity to this date has not ever gotten anyone out, hmm. you know, because even guys now that are throwing a hundred miles an hour, hitters are still turning that around guys that are throwing a hundred miles an hour. You know what they're also throwing split fingers, curve balls, sliders, sweepers, all the other off speed stuff, right? Because the hundred miles an hour that'll get turned around hitters hit fastballs that's why you see so many off-speed pitches so even the guys that have high end top end velocity um by the time they get to the big leagues they may still be throwing just as hard but they're not using it they're spinning the ball and you know when you mentioned 12 year olds i remember years ago there was a kid at a school that i taught at a catcher that had tommy john surgery as a sure. sophomore in high school and that was the first time i had ever heard of a high schooler and you're right. I've heard 10, 11, 12 year old kids. I'm like, these kids haven't even grown in their body. Now, number one, they probably went to more than one doctor to get that approval because I, from what I've heard, I've, I've got a couple of friends in, in the medical field and they say, I would absolutely not do that surgery on a kid under a certain age just because right. you, you, you're like, there's got to be something different. You know, Josh Beckett, spring high school. You know, World Series champion, his father would not let him be a pitcher in his select ball team. Mm -hmm. He only pitched in high school and he had to play outfield. And the coaches were like, we need him to pitch. He's like, I'm sorry. He's resting his arm. Right. He had maybe one shoulder injury towards the end of his career, stayed healthy because he had a regimented routine that his father put him through and stuck with it and turned out to be one of the better pitchers of his generation. I think one of the reasons why I was blessed to play, to pitch so long, I didn't really pitch much as an amateur. You mm. know, I didn't. I think I threw 11 innings my senior year in high school. There was no select ball. Right. When I got to college, um, I, I had a back injury that didn't let me pitch much my freshman year. Uh, then my sophomore year, I did have an elbow, a, a, a strained elbow right before the draft. Um, but I didn't really pitch till I got into college and I didn't pitch that much in college. So I think that was a big reason why I had the longevity that I did. I did have a a shoulder injury early in my career. I missed most of the 1990 season. 
uh, with a labrum tear. You know, back then they didn't even know what the labrum rule was. You know, now it's a six to eight month injury. I rehabbed it. They pushed me like it was a two to three week injury. So I ended wow. up missing the whole, the whole season or uh, most of the season. Um, but after that, I, I was, I was fine. I think that I just didn't have the wear and tear, but you have to remember there was no select. I played summer baseball. It was a leak. That's all we played. Yeah. You know? Yeah. There, yeah. You know, and, and there is a, this is a different day and a different time. You tell you've got year round baseball, you've got, you know, you know, and, and I think too, and I mean, this is probably another topic for another show, but when you, when you have parents literally competing against each other, <laughs> to say my son can throw harder than yours yep. or hey did you hear my son went two for three with two home runs yesterday and he threw a no hitter and it's like you know when the parents live vicariously through the kids and don't let the kids chase what they want to chase that's that's unfortunately one of the residual effects um right you're preaching you to the choir i deal with this stuff every single solitary day yep. uh and it's, it's it's tough it's tough that um you know, you, you're, you're trying to, to help a kid. Um, but I don't pe actually tell you the truth. I don't use the word velocity mm. when I'm coaching. You know, if I do, I'm not talking about how hard you throw. I'm talking about speed differential off your, you know, your change up or your, your breaking ball you're throwing. That's what I'm talking about. Mm. I have, Hey, how hard am I throwing? I have, I, my, my, I have no idea. I don't know. I don't know. And it doesn't matter. You know what? Put the ball where it's supposed to be put. Doesn't matter how hard it is, you'll get hitters out. Exactly. I mean, you know, i.e. Greg Maddox, the mm -hmm. professor. I mean, you right. know, here's a guy that would be considered a declining athlete in today's baseball game, you know? Sure. Um, well, I mean, there's still guys around. There's not very many. Kyle Hendricks, you know, right. dude tops out at 88 miles an hour, but he can hammer nails with his fastball. He's got a good change up, and, uh, and he makes it work. I hope. This is my hope that baseball is making a very slow transition back to pitchability. Now, listen, there's a, the radar gun's not going away. Right. Hard, wanting everyone to throw hard is not going away. But, you know, I think that I hope that we have a situation that, you know, there's a lot of guys that are, are out of the game that can pitch their butts off. They just don't throw 100 miles an hour. Mm. So, you know, I'm, I'm thinking that there's some organizations, the Astros are one of them, you know, that it wasn't always about, you know, to go back to when this, when this run started, right. Okay. AJ Hinch is, is at the helm. They had a bullpen of big time, diverse arms. Everybody didn't throw a hundred miles an hour. Yeah. They had some hard throwers, but they also had guys that threw a lot of sliders, had guys that had a low three quarter arm angle that was going to sink the ball. Um, you know, you had so many different arm slots that no one looked the same and they were very, very successful. Mm -hmm. I'm hoping that we're having a transition back to that a little bit. I don't think we'll ever go all the way back to pitchability. I mean, I pitched with some guys. Tom Glavin was never a hard thrower. He's a hall of famer. Yeah. You know, exactly. I mean, he, he topped out at, you know, 90, 91, but what was his pitch? He could hit an outside corner with a fastball and a changeup going to, he went to the hall of fame for it. No. And that's, and I mean, you know, well stated and no one would know better than you because you've, you've been alongside some of the, some of the greatest, um, and just to watch them work. And, you know, I was impressed and just to kind of wrap this up, I'm, I'm always impressed whenever Justin Verlander talks about his preparedness, how aware yeah. he is of his body. And he's not cavalier at all with his recovery. He's not trying to rush it. He's very cerebral. He's very smart. I mean, we're talking about a first ballot Hall of Famer when once once he hangs his hat up. And I'm just glad that he's with this Houston Astros team. And I think when he comes back, he's going to be ready. But, you know, to switch gears here, this rough debut by this rookie. Tell us about nerves of oh a, my gosh. of 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 an opening game, and then we'll get to the rescue of the bats that came in to kind of help them out a little bit. But right, how nerve wracking is that? Oh, yeah, I mean, there was you know, I used to have young guys come up, um, 
in, in the years I was playing and I would, you know, walk up to them, shake their hand, welcome, you know, you're going to be a part of this, this, that, you know, the first thing I would tell them is to remember to breathe. Mm. I would, I said, Hey, don't forget to breathe, take some deep breaths. So you can, you know, at, at, at least not hyperventilate his heart rate had to be out of the, out of this world. Oh yeah. I mean, he's not just pitching in the big leagues. He's pitching at home. He grew up True. just a few miles from globe life field. Yeah. You know, I mean, it was, you know, went to university of Texas. He uh, had one start in triple a and then got called up and you're not usually, I mean, listen, yes, you're one step away from the big leagues. Right. But at the very beginning of, I mean, he had one start, he pitched five innings. Um, you're not thinking about that. You're not no. thinking, you know, no. you're not, you're not even into the flow of your season, much less thinking I'm. Mean, it's about time to get called up. Um, so yeah, I mean, the nerves had to be just through the roof. And I think you kind of saw that you didn't yeah. see the real Blair Henley. Um, you know, he's a guy that, that has good stuff, uh, pitching university of Texas, but I think in high school, crazy number, he, he threw three no hitters in a row. Wow. In high school. Really Pretty cool. Um, oh, know that. Okay. you know, so it, it, it's, it's unfortunate that he, um, you know, he had to, well, it's not unfortunate he had to do this because now he is officially, regardless of how bad he pitched, he's a big leaguer. There you, you know? go. That's right. something that he that no one can ever take anything away from him. Uh, I don't know if he's going to get another start right now, but um, you know, yeah, it's they, something he'll always remember. But yeah, he he was um, he was. I thought he was visibly flustered. Yeah, no, yeah, you could tell. Yeah, they the, they announced almost immediately after the game that he was being sent back down to. Okay, I did not hear that. Yeah, and what I'm wondering is, I think the next move would probably be if Fromber is out for an extended time, that you would possibly call back up Mashinsky and put Belak into a starter role if they want to go with another. Could be. Because, you know, Belak is your only guy up there, I think, that really has been stretched out ever in that length you know seth martinez pitched his all-time most three and two-thirds innings but did excellent um but the bats come in mike in jordan alvarez victor carantini um alex bregman come out hit get get multi-hit games but jordan alvarez is starting to feel it he said the first series he was off a little yeah. He wasn't used to sitting behind someone who saw one pitch and swung <laughs> and then he had to bat. So, and I mean, because Jordan is so methodical and so calm, a lot of people are like, Oh my gosh, I think we just got the formula wrong. I'm like, no, he'll figure it out. Yeah. And he dude can hit lasers in, in, in Arlington. Dude and, can hit. He's going to hit hitting our, our balls below the zone. He's, he's golfing. He's, he's breaking out the nine iron Yeah, and he's hitting them like he's hitting like he's hitting a three iron, just a line drive to right, right field. But um, I love what I saw. I don't know if you know this, Mike. Every hitter got on base tonight, but not by way of hit. You had two hit batters, which was mm-hmm. Chaz and and Jose Abreu, and then Jose Altuve got on with the walk. But everybody else got a hit. But everybody yeah. get on base. So what I liked, what the Astros did, they scored two in the first. And then the Rangers dropped the five spot in the bottom of the first. And they're like, oh, my goodness. Okay, everybody buckle your chin straps because this is going to be a a rough ride. Astros drop another two in the top of the second. And you have to – the guy that has to get the silver or the gold star for the silver boot, Seth Martinez. Mm. He goes out and he just stymies the Rangers offense going three – uh, going three and two thirds of just one hit baseball, striking out a couple guys, but he really just, you know, took all the momentum away from the Rangers. And then the offense just kept going. And that's what, you know, we haven't seen lately from this offense is they scored in three, di- four different innings, two yeah. in the first, two in the second, three in the third, three in the fifth. I'm sorry, three in the fourth, three in the fifth. Yeah. No, so they scored. That- crooked numbers in four different innings. You do that, you're going to win a lot of baseball games. And that's where this offense really, I think, settles. And I think they can score between seven to ten runs a night. 
I mean, th- I mean, look, you had your hottest hitting offensive player on the bench in Yiner Diaz. The backup catcher come in, Carantini, hits a home run from the left-handed side of the plate. Yeah. Last year, all seven of his home runs were from the left side of the plate. And then, I mean, Bregman comes in, looks excellent today, three for five. And like you said, you know, the game before where they scored the three runs and, you know, Ronel Blanco flirted with a second no-hitter, which is just insane. But they only needed those three runs. But you could see, had they done that last night, they would have lost five to three. Sure. Because they only scored the three runs. They put together, like you said, multiple innings with crooked numbers, and that's what they haven't done early. And I think this team's going to find that formula more times than not. And this team has a lot of potential to score a lot of runs. Well, what they did tonight is they they stacked those quality at bats on top of each other. What we've seen so right. far this year in the in the nights that they struggled, that there were some hits, but they weren't able to get the hit, or they weren't able to get multiple hits in a row. They you know they just you know, just off just a little bit. They but they were giving themselves opportunities. Tonight they got opportunities and they capitalized, and you know that always makes it feel good. I think we also have to talk about the rest of the bullpen because yes, you know Henley only goes a third of an inning. He gives up the five runs. But following Martinez, Scott Belak and Brian Abreu go out, and they finish off. You know they were you know, they went eight and two thirds shutout baseball tonight. Unreal. I mean, you you I I've been in the bullpen when the the starter really really struggles. You all down there start looking at each other. And you go, okay, who's pitching tonight? Johnny Staff is pitching. Everybody is pitching. Right. Buckle Everybody. your chin straps because this is gonna be this is gonna be a long night. But that's not really what happened. They did a great job of holding down a very good Texas Rangers offense. Exactly. And you you used only one of your three back end guys, Abreu. Right. And they needed so, to use Brian because yeah. he hasn't pitched well and he needed the work. He, you know, he, he, he hasn't pitched in a few days. So, you know, you were able to stay away from Presley. You were able to stay away from Hader. Uh, you know, they look pretty good now going into Kansas City. They do, yeah. So we'll 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 have to keep our fingers crossed that there's not much going on with Frommer. Maybe it's just a few days off that the, the elbow gets back where it needs to be and get him right back into that rotation. Yeah, and that's the thing. You just you just never know until they tell you something. And, and but you know the butterflies are there. I know it was at any time, any pitcher, it doesn't matter who it is, we hear elbow strain, elbow soreness, elbow weakness. I get a lump in my throat. I get butterflies in my stomach because you know where it goes a large portion of the time and it goes to Tommy John. Yeah. And that's, you know, when I, when I heard the elbow thing, I was like, Oh my gosh. But you know, that's why I think this team tonight steps up in a big way. Joe Espada said afterwards, I caught his press conference right before we started recording. Um, and he was like, you know, what was your message to Henley when he came out? He, he he said, I went over to him. I reassured him. You're a part of this team, no matter what happens. Um, you helped us. You went out there and we've got your back. We're, we're going to back you up. We're going to go out there. We're going to get the hits. And yeah. that's what a baseball team does. You know, um, when you see this offense struggling, you're like, okay, I know they've got more in them. I know they can right. do so much more. And that's why I was afraid of that five run first by the Rangers because hitting typically is contagious. And if you get the other side just going up there, just unabashed, and you know that they are just ready to hit the cover when you got Seager, when you got Simeon, who are first pitch hitters, you know, they did that to um, Abreu. Abreu's first two hits that that he he didn't give up like, like his first two outs were hard lined outs. Right. And then I, did you see the play between Chaz and Jordan where they almost collided? Oh my goodness. I was, yeah, I did. Jordan would have knocked Chaz back to Philadelphia. I mean, he looked like a linebacker was about to take out a running. It looked back. like Chaz gave oh. right at the last second. He I mean, he ended up sliding behind Jordan. I think Chaz is a superhero. I think he's like an X-Man or a mutant. Man. Because I don't know how you stay away from that guy. Yeah, that is a large human being coming at you. 
I mean, even if it's at an angle, but still coming at you, that's, that's not a collision. And to tell you the truth, you know, it's not like Chaz is a tiny little fellow either. Right. Right. So, you know, that could have been just about as ugly as it, it you know, we could, uh, we well, could, a nightmare could have been. Well, remember when him and Pena collided? Yeah. That was, you know, I believe that was in New York. But, um, you know, looking ahead to the Kansas City series, they've got one of the best pitching staffs right now in baseball. They've got Bobby Witt Jr., who's a generational player. We've got Javier going in the first game against Reagans. I like Javier in this. Hunter Brown, who desperately needs a bounce-back performance. I don't want to get your take on that here in a second. And then J.P. France going against Brady Singer. And so talk about that middle game, Hunter Brown as a pitcher. Last game, it looked like he was just absolutely throwing woofle balls, soft toss, batting yeah. practice, whatever whatever term you want to use. What is his goal going into this next game? Are you just erasing that last game and moving forward with your game plan? How does he attack preparation for the, for the Kansas City Royals? You have to erase it. You have to let it go. You know, um, you have to have a short memory. And, uh, you know, a lot of times when you – it's harder to let something go when you pitch okay and there's like, you know, one hit or one situation you give something up. That kind of sticks with it. When you just stink, sometimes it's a lot easier to let go. I just say, you know what? That's that true. was just a bad day. You know, we saw that from Fromber on opening day. You know, he did not pitch. He started off okay in the first two innings, but he did not pitch well. He did not. Then he bounced back. And, you know, Hunter has been through it now. You know, he pitched well in the first half of the season last year. The second half, he pitched more, way more than he ever had pitched before. Right. But, uh, yeah, I think, you know, you have to – you're a professional. And when you're a professional, you have to be able to take the good and the bad. Take, you know, something positive out of the bad outing and then just go out and do your thing, you know. He's got – the the problem he had in in his first start was location. You know, he had bad location. You know, you throw the ball in the middle of the plate, big league hitters are going to hit it. It doesn't matter whether it's the Yankees or whether it's Kansas City. He's going to have to ma- execute some pitches and really work on on location and changing speeds and and not just trying to throw the ball by everyone. Yeah, exactly. And, you know, Hunter does have that competitive nature, that competitive spirit. And um, what I do like is that more than likely Diaz will probably be behind the plate with him. Uh, because I'm sure because he had the day off him and Diaz worked a lot when they were in um, triple a as well. But, you know, I like the Astros chances going, um, you know, they split the series. They won the series prior to that. Prior to that, we know they got swept. So they're winning more, more than they weren't, you know, they're, yeah. they're, you know, three wins away from 500 early in, in this early season. But even if you get two out of three from Kansas city, I think, that is that is a win. I mean, of course, sure. you want to sweep everybody, but that's impossible. I say if they can take two of these three, Mike, they're going to feel pretty good because you got to feel good facing the Rangers at home because the last time the Rangers played you at home, they just they kind of just laughed in our faces and beat well, us especially up. the way it started. You know, in the first exactly. two games, they had the the Rangers just handed it to the Astros. Oh yeah, and I then like, and then you you bounce back, and I mean to tell you the truth, you the, the Rangers have to look at this and go, um, they can't be happy with the split because they were up two zero. I mean that you know you 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 know you have your biggest rival by the throat, and you let him go, and that's right. and that's kind of what happened. So I think that even though yes they split with the Rangers, I think you still look at it; they're carrying the momentum. Just simply because you know they're 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 the winners of two straight right now. Kansas City's not a bad team, you know. No, the the Astros need to just go and and take care of themselves. They need to play good, clean baseball, execute your pitches, drive some runs in when you get them in scoring position, get a couple two out hits, and and you'll be fine. But Kansas City's playing pretty good baseball right now, and so you're gonna have to you're gonna have to be on your A game. You know, one of the things that you're always looking for in the long haul of the baseball season is consistency. Right. And this is something A.J. Hinch used to talk about all the time was winning series. You know, winning streaks are great. The problem with winning streaks is they end. Yes. Win series. If you win, you know, you win every series, you're going to be where you want to be. 
That's just that's just the way it is. And that's the consistency that you're looking at. As fans, we get to stress out day in and day out. We get to ride the roller coaster right. of emotions. The players, they're trying to stay even keeled. They want to just come do my job. And if we're better than the other team, then we'll beat those guys. And, and that's kind of how you have to look at it because it's just such a long season. Exactly. And so just, just real quick, um, I want to do a quick rundown. Um, in the American League West, the Angels in the in the Rangers are tied at six and four to top the division. Then you have Houston, <laughs> Seattle, Oakland. I think that might change. Boston is seven and three. Didn't see that coming. Um, Toronto five and six, but that looks like a strong division. You have New York, Boston, Baltimore, then Tampa and Toronto. Then in the central, you got Cleveland, Detroit, and KC up top. Um, and then jump over to the National League. Of course, Atlanta's on top, six and three. Ronald Acuna Jr. and company. Just a just a crazy good opponent. I mean, them and the Phillies, just yeah. phenomenal competitors on, on on those teams. That National League East is a fun division. But then you have Pittsburgh, Mike, nine and two, the best record <laughs> in the league. Isn't that crazy. They do this every year. They did it last year. Yeah. Out of the they were block. like 20 and eight or something yeah, last yeah, year. They were, and then they just <laughs> fell off. But Milwaukee, Chicago behind them. And then you've got in the West, you've got the Dodgers, you've got the Padres, and you've got the Diamondbacks and the Giants are tied. And, of course, the Rockies are just – they just love to clean up the bottom of that division every year, it seems like. But I think there's going to be some competitiveness. You know, Miami's ha- going to have a tough year. They've got so many injuries, 1-10 in 10 on their early season. It looks like that is going to be – this is going to be one of those years that maybe they want to forget. I don't know – I don't know that they're going to be able to do a whole lot this year. They might break yeah. records for all the wrong reasons. I don't know. Yeah. They're better than they look. I mean, they swing the bat better than they did a couple of years ago. They did. Um, they did. They've just gotten off to such a horrendous start. And you know, the old saying, you can't win. You can't win the division in April, but you can lose it. And I mean, think about this. They're That's one true. and 10. They have to go on a long winning streak just to get back to relevancy, which is 500. I mean, that's tough, right? You know what you, you know, we've seen Seattle do this a couple different times is bury themselves early in the season and, and end up being relevant, but they have to use so much energy and so many wins just to get back up to 500 that you lose your mojo. Cause you're, you know, everybody's got a run in them. Right. How long is the run? You don't really know, depending on the talent you have. But the, again, the problem with the streak is streaks end. You know, you cool off, and that's what's happened with Seattle. That's what Miami – Miami's going to have to go on some kind of run, you know. Yeah, they are. Start, winning, you know, start looking for that consistency of winning series. And just one game at a time. I mean, yeah. one game at a time. So you now the, to- I mean, the, the good thing is they have, you know, what? What is it? 150-plus games left? Yeah, exactly. you know, so you still have plenty of time to do it. You've just, uh, you know, you've bar- you've dug yourself a little bit of a hole. And, you know, you are the team that everybody says, at least we're not the Marlins right now. <laughs> so you're unfortunately that guy. Yeah. But, Mike, this this has been a great episode. Um, I'm, I'm glad we hopped on because I think there's a lot of relevant stuff that people are going to want to listen to. And we hope that you guys are subscribing to our YouTube, our YouTube channel. Um, we are almost at 200 subscribers early on. And we need y'all to go over to Spotify. We need y'all to listen because we know some people don't get on YouTube. Share it with some friends. If you see Mike or I in public, we'll have a little card to hand you with a QR code. We'll give you one of those. And I'll be announcing a giveaway soon to help us up those numbers. So thank y'all for tuning in. Look, from our guys at State of the Art Barbershop in Friendswood, Texas, go see my guy ever at 1616 South Friendswood Drive. Make an appointment with him today. Check them out if you are in the Bay Area here in in Southeast Houston. And then ramshirts.com. Now, we've got a new, like Mike has the original, the OG back to the bullpen shirt, but we've got a brand new one. So I will put a link. I will put a QR code up on our YouTube channel. It will go up on our socials. Actually, it's on our our X feed right now. So go to ramshirts.com. We are a part of the Ramshirts lineup, and they are proud sponsors of this show as well. So coming to you live from the Ram Shirt Studios, I'm H-Town Wheelhouse, and he's Mike Stanton. Until next time, you guys make sure that you're going back to the bullpen. Adios. Y'all have a good one. 
Looking to the bullpen to bring my lefty in. Keep the lead and make your team look pedestrian. It's in your wood house, we'll swing for the fish. You know it's money around here, man, I ain't talking expense. Strike one, he the low in the way, you can't hit it. Know you wanna start a rally, but you better forget it. Strike two, off speed, same spot, you're caught looking. Get ready at the plate, this time you're not cooking. Strike three, swing it out of the zone. You ain't even touch it first. Tell me how they gonna drive you home. Walk it back, walk it back, looking like we ain't cool. Then. The game's over, my 